Stallside Podcast is brought to you by Rudin Riddle Veterinary Pharmacy. As partners in your animal's health care, we strive to bring you the highest quality medications, including custom compounds, that are formulated and produced right here in our pharmacy. Along with medications, we also strive to bring you high quality and relevant information, such as that available here on the podcast. So if you like what you hear and see, be sure to refer us to your friends and remember to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. We've done a lot of great episodes already that you may need to catch up on with more just around the corner. One last reminder, nothing you here on the podcast should be construed as veterinary advice, which should only come from a veterinarian with whom you have a relationship. Welcome to Stallside Podcast. Dr. Scott Pierce, part one. Bart, how's it going? It's great. How are you today, Peter? I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, we're inviting one of our guests back today. My friend and mentor, Dr. Scott Pierce, is coming back in. It's uh, perfect timing with sales season. You know, in the heat of summer, we're just headed into these sales. And um, we're going to talk about endoscopy and how that works at the sales. Yeah, that's not something I sort of do, but I'm sort of fascinated by it because people are buying these horses based on these opinions and how people right. are actually grading these airways. And that's just one part of buying a horse, but it's something that people look at because if you can't breathe, nothing else matters, right? That, that's exactly right. The, these uh, racehorses need a lot of air, and uh, grading these these airways is, is one way we determine whether or not they can do it. So, But a lot of money is... Um, you know, a lot of money can be left on the table if uh, you, you get a grade on an endoscopy that you don't like. Yeah, and I, I'm looking forward to Scott's opinion on that because, I mean, he's done as many as anybody. And, you know, the thing is you want people to be consistent within themselves. And I want to get his take on do you actually need that perfect airway right. to actually have a successful horse? Well, he's, he's, he's not only has he done the exams, he's, he's done the studies yep. and, and, and put the numbers behind it. So it'll be, let's, let's talk to him about that. Yeah, that sounds great. So coming up next, Dr. Scott Pierce from Rude Riddle talking about upper airway endoscopy and sales yearlings. <laughs> Scott, welcome back to Stallside. Uh, thanks. Glad to be here. Good to have you here. So interesting topic today. Um, we touched on it the first time you're in about your uh, great involvement in uh, scoping of the upper airway for sales. And we'd just like you to expand upon that and uh, talk about how you got into it, why it's important, and uh, what it means for buyers and sellers. Okay. Um, be glad to. The The bottom line is how I got into it was um, really we began – scoping yearlings which wasn't done very common uh, it wasn't a common place of practice at that time in the back in like 86 1986 1987 um and we just started doing it then uh and to the point where you'd go up to a to a um consigner and they say you want to scope this yearling uh i said yeah um, I'd, I'd like to or the client would like me to uh, the same with foals when nobody had ever scoped foals before at the sales. And so the same uh, reluctance or pushback there initially. But what happened was what piqued my, tweaked my inter, uh, interest was um, the, the lack of knowledge, the lack of, uh, the lack of science. And, and so there was really no information not, and, and we'd had no, uh, information to hang our hat on and, and how to call things and, and, you know, just clinical curiosity more than anything. And, and, and really what, what really was, uh, the kind of the impetus was, uh, I was doing a, a examination on a stallion prospect that was supposed to go to somewhere overseas. I don't recall. And the client asked that I scope it, you know, even though it was a racehorse, I mean, it was a, a successful racehorse. It, it wasn't a grade one winner, but I think a grade two winner. <clears throat> and, um, he said, just scope it anyway. And even though it's a stallion prospect, and I said, oh, cause they may want to race it later. And so I did. And I had, I had a couple students with me at the time. And, um, I remember scoping this horse and, and it was not a good airway. And this horse had just raced successfully, and it was at Ke it was at Keeneland, just uh, uh, won a race at Keeneland, and and I it, it it amazed me so much that I took the time to show these students. I said, "Look at this horse. He won. I can't remember the amount eight seven or eight hundred thousand dollars. And look at this airway. So what are we missing here? This horse is a good horse. 
<clears throat> with a less than perfect airway. Um, and so that, I remember that like it was yesterday, that it was a, the, um, the catalyst that really got me interested in tracking them and looking at them and looking at sire variations and looking at all the, the, uh, uh, the parameters of a young horse airway. Um, <clears throat> which, and so that's, that's really got what, uh, that's really why I started it's because there, the, there was no information. There was no grading scale. There was, you had no idea. It was very subjective and there needed to be some definitions and some, uh, clarity. So, so we do, we throw around a lot of terms and you know, there's, there's a lot, there's grading systems and there's different philosophies and stuff, but could, could you talk about our grading system and, and where that came from? Maybe you could give us some examples. Um, you know, maybe folks could watch this on YouTube if they're, Watching or listening. Well, on the first, you podcast. know, just some backdrop here. I mean, people by that buyers and sellers, they want all veterinarians to have an exact definition of of an airway and have have it all be the same. And you call it this, but I mean, there's 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 differences of opinion of of, of airways, and there are it's no different than a, a an agent looking at a horse. You may like a horse. I may not like it or the other, the other consigner might not like it. So it's, it's similar to that. And these guys, you know, the, the deal with that all day that somebody didn't like his horse, but the other guy did kind of the same with airways. So there's really no definitive grading. I know that, you know, I do a lot of work, um, uh, in England and, and, uh, and do some work for some practices here and they call them differently. They use, a grade one, two, three scale, but I've learned to improvise that into my scale because I do a lot of airways for, for a, a practice over there, or I used to before videos. And so I know that my two B, for instance, is one of their threes. So it's not, it's not rocket science. But I, you know, I, I a couple things. One is you're, you're. I don't think you're ever going to get everybody on the same page to call them exactly the same. It's not going to happen. Two, you, everyone has to remember that these are, these are babies. They're young horses. And one of the greatest fallacies that I think that we have and, and the, the um, uh, confusion is we, we're using adult, adult examinations or adult grading and adult characteristics to evaluate baby airways, to evaluate foals and yearlings, and they do change through time. Another fallacy is that... Uh, the uh, incident, you know, just because they're a grade one as a yearling or a grade two A doesn't mean they're going to stay that way. There's a lot of horses that become paralyzed at two, two to three, a lot of grade ones, a lot of two A's. So, uh, and I've lost, I've lost accounts because I call an airway as a yearling, a two A, which is slight asymmetry. We'll go over this grades in a minute, but at three, the horse was paralyzed and that client elected not to use me. Well, that's, I, there's no way to predict that. So, <clears throat> well, that, that's one of the, you know, we, most of us are packing around video scopes now. So that's one of the things that's very helpful to, I, I record all my exams for just that reason. If something changes on you and you, it's, it's helpful too, to go back. If you find something in the fall that you didn't have in the spring to go back and say, okay, was this, did this horse truly change? Did I do a bad exam? Was I not, you know, right. mucus on the screen, whatever, but it's good to be able to go back. And I think that we have better equipment now than we had four or five years ago. Better equipment and the, the buyers and sellers are much more educated. In fact, they, they watch the videos and they know most of the educated ones know a bad throat when one pops up on the screen. And yeah, you're right. It's nice to video. And I video every airway that I do. And, and I think I've about crashed the server, but there's a bunch of videos in there. But I wanted to say too that you know, knowing the variation and, and, and people want an exact grade, it's and and have consistency. I'll give you an example. Last year at the sale in England at Tattersalls, I there was a fractious horse that no one could scope, so they did a they they video all of them there anyway, <clears throat> and they videoed the horse and they just so happened to put it in the repository there. I looked at it, I said it's okay, it's a two. I gave it a two A or you know. A, basically gave it a two a and I went back to the stall to vet the horse, um, did the physical, et cetera. 
And they said it was scratched. I said, why did it scratch? He said, because my vet called it a 2B. And so there, there is part of the problem there that, that there's a, I was perfectly okay with it. And I know I'm more critical than you are, Bart. And here's someone that was a lot more critical than I am uh, calling this airway a 2B. They scratched the horse, which I had a, I had a buyer on the horse. So, you know, there's just, I think it's impossible to go through that. The grades the, the here, I just went through the, 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 the British kind of one, two, three grades. Um, you have, and we'll talk about this, the subjective grades, which I hate the a plus a, a minus an a minus many times is not a good airway, but in, in, you know, in school, a minus is in my book were pretty good. Um, and then ours is, you know, there's this Havenmeyer scale and we have the modified, we use that mostly. And that supposedly, um, at one time was meant to be kind of an internationally accepted scale, which it's, hasn't really, hasn't really been the case. Um, but we use, <clears throat> um, uh, it was, a, we used to call it the modified Cornell system. That was the first one that was out grade one, two, and three. And then we had to break it down a little bit more. Dr. Emerson and I did it sometime um, where we have grade one and we'll go through the videos here in a, in a little bit, but I'll just go through them briefly. Grade one is, per, is, is symmetrical synchronous movement of the arytenoids. They move together in harmony. Um, they are <clears throat> about... 10 to 15% of the population. And this is what upsets me more than anything that I don't know where this has come from, but this, this criticism over these two air, two a airways, it just blows my mind because that's 75% of the population. And we'll get onto some studies that we've done here in a minute, in a, in a little bit, but the two A's are slight asymmetry, maximal abductions easily achieved and maintained 75% of your young horse population. Period. End of story. Two Bs are airways that maximal abduction, uh, maximal abduction occurs with difficulty, meaning you have to hold their air off. You hold their air off, you kind of choke them down a little bit, and they maximally abduct, and it's uh, with difficulty. And then you get into the grade threes, and they broke them all down to three A, B, C. It's hard for me to differentiate between the Bs and the Cs, but... A 3A is usually 3A, 3B, 3C. There's still movement, but the maximal abduction is not achieved and certainly is not maintained. Um, and we'll talk about studies here in a little bit, but those are horses that historically do not do well down the road, just period. And then we break down epiglottises, or we do in our practice, and we try to grade these because – um, it's important for function that we'll get to in it with, uh, after reviewing a study, but you know, we, I break them down normal, slightly flaccid, which is a grade one, mildly flaccid grade two, and then moderate and severe flaccids, which are hard to separate. Neither one of them are good. Uh, those horses don't do well either down the road. Um, and that's, that's our grading system. And what we've tried to do and, you know, I don't know a, a better way to do it. And the idea of the, the grades was to have to, ha and, and a lot of veterinarians I can have this conversation with. When I say this horse was a 2A, or in the literature it's called 2 1, but if I, there's 2 A's kind of stuck with me, then I talk to one of my colleagues that I work with. They know exactly what 2A with a normal epiglottis, they know exactly what I'm saying. Slight asymmetry. Easily, easily see abduction, maintaining the throat's okay. They know what it means when a, with a two B, but at the same time, two Bs are variable. You always have to take in the sire variations. They're, you're seeing that more and more now. And the more scopes you do, the more you're going to see these sire variations. And I can't get into names obviously, um, but there's sire variations now where they're, you're seeing, and this is where, this is where horses can get failed that shouldn't be. You're seeing some of this kind of mild 2B or 2AB or not a good 2A. 
<clears throat> that's coming into the mix a little bit. And it's it for that particular sire line, that's their airway. That's their 2A. They do fine. Um, there were some horses. The oh, um, I didn't go through the percentages. The 2B in my book is about 7.5% seven, seven to 8 9% of my airways that I examine are 2Bs. And then grade 3s are about 2%. So round them up, that's about 100%. Don't see many grade fours, which are paralyzed because they scratch them from the sale. You don't see them in the uh, sales population. If, it, if you do, it's they don't meet conditions and they have to be withdrawn. So that's, that's, basically, that's basically the grading system that um, once we get into studies and kind of where we are and where we're going, uh, we can review review the numbers a little bit or the percentages and what we know as far as racing prognosis and what I tell clients and all that. Oh, I was going to say on sire variation, there's like I've said, the, 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 uh, two B average in my book is about seven and a half, eight percent. Some of these sires, some of these popular sires these days are running, uh, you know, cause I track sires. Um, they're running as much as 19% two B's. Um, and then there's some sires out there, popular sires out there now that are consistently grade ones and have a higher percentage of grade one airways symmetry. Um, and you could almost buy them without scoping them. They're just awesome airways. And there's a few, a few of those out there, not very many, but a few of the, the sires. So, so the horses, and I know a couple of the sires that you're talking about that are throwing a higher percentage of say, say two B's. But those are those are some of our better horses. Right. So are there good horses coming out of that other eighty percent, or like you said, these are some of their normal throats, and are, are they more capable of, um, of being good race horses with a with a two B? Say, if, <laughs> if you're from one of those sire lines that that produce more two Bs. Well, we need to go through what what a two B means because I've had successful race horses that are two Bs. Yeah. Um, and maybe they're more genetically inclined to be a better two B than say some other, some other line. I don't know what I have looked at. I've not really seen that difference yet because I just put all my two Bs to get, you know, when I'm doing research and studying, I just put them all together. I've never, and that'd be an interesting study actually just taking those sires and see if, their two Bs do better than say another horse's two B. You know that that would be probably an interesting interesting study. I've never done that, but but we know what the grades mean. I don't. But like, let me just repeat uh, to people listening: a two A is an A throat. Period. End of story. It's a good good airway. I don't know why there's been this confusion over this. Um. They are, there's no statistical difference between grade ones and two A's in, in every study, in the yearling studies that I've done. No difference whatsoever. In fact, in a study that we'll, study, we'll talk about here in a little bit is actually the grade two A's outperform the grade ones in a, in a study that we're attempting to get published right now. Um, so that, I, you know, I wanted to repeat that because I, I don't see where that's coming from and it, the goal here was to have that be our consistent language, at least here in the United States, that we all know what a 1 and 2A, 2B, 3, we know what it is. You can communicate. And I know there's a movement among consigners to, to try to get rid of this scale, but do you want to go to the subjective grade that your A, your A plus scope, is that my A plus scope? Is your A A minus? Is your A minus my A minus? It's too subjective. Well, and that's the, there's no definition for for that grading scale too. And I had a I had a consigner call me just today and tell me you got to get rid of this two A thing. He said because I, I we're trying to sell horses and people come up to this back ring, say I cannot pin hook a horse that's two A. So based on your numbers, right, that person if he's not if he's only buying grade ones, he's thrown out ninety percent of the horses. Right, he's been not eighty five. Eighty five. Yeah, he's he, if he's if he. If he's going by my scale, then he's he's bidding on fifteen percent of the airways. 15%. Or he, or he's buying horses that are on reports that are on a different scale 
which which is right not defined right because so many times on these subjective grades then then what it does is you got okay whose subjective grade is it and are they more lenient than i would be etc um so it's 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 a it's a big problem but it, the the two a's are not going anywhere because that de- used to describe functionality <clears throat> but what's going to happen here and it's i see it happening now and it defeats the purpose is that the, there's an inclination now to to go back to that use this one two a two b three group and make it kind of subjective and everybody's calling more throats grade one that shouldn't be there are two A's. And so that's where we're headed. And, um, it's not, it's not a positive move. I think it's, it's not. And it's really because people don't haven't either read the literature or, or read the research or they're, they're not paying attention because the two A's are, Two A's are superstars, along with grade ones. So, what's the answer to that, though? How do we how do we get people back to buying those two A's when they when they should be? They're doing themselves a disservice, their clients a disservice by not buying those. Do you think can we get the sales companies to adopt a uniform system of of grading if we're going to keep using reports? I guess um, that could be discussed. I mean, that's difficult because you know, like I said, who's going to grade them? Your your uh, my two B may be your three A. No, but, but what I'm saying is, if we're all using basically the same system, we not might, might not call them the same thing, but if we're at least speaking the same language, if we're using a one through four rather than an A through a triple A plus system, for instance, getting us all to use speak the same language at least. Yeah, that would be that would be it. It it you, you have the break the ones are. Are straightforward. The threes are straightforward. Yeah. The fours are paralyzed, so that's straightforward. It's pretty straightforward. So the twos, that's why we broke them down to two A's and two B's, because um, there is a difference in that two group um, that we found needed to be addressed. Uh, and, and everyone needs to keep in mind, you've got young horses. They change. You know, everyone's seen it. They change morning and night. They change the little bit that they have. They get pharyngitis. They get sick. They don't. They displace. They scope differently. Uh, restraint matters. Sometimes they bend their necks back. I've had people bend their necks around. I've had people, when they, when they, when they, when they restrain them, put their shoulders up in their laryngeal area, in their throat latch, and it, it deviates. Their, their, it makes them look somewhat like a 2B. So restraint's important, how they act, how they relax, all this stuff comes into play. And it's, it's a young horse, it's young horse uh, endoscopy. And all that has to be taken into amount. The, the, the thing about, to, to your point, previous point, Bart, is that a 2A, you know, you're going to miss a lot of good horses, a lot of good horses, and you're going to pass up on uh, uh, some, some superstars that you should be bidding on. So let's talk about the numbers just a little bit in those in those groups. So basically, ones and two A's, you said, perform equally well. Okay, let's go back. We first did a study about 20 years ago. Rolf and I did, presented to AEP. Uh, I was on like 800 and some odd horses, yearlings. And at the time, it was significant because we found no difference between ones, two A's, and two B's. They were all the same. So time went on, and you go, is that Right. So we, uh, we expanded the study to near 3000 and, uh, Dr. Garrett was nice enough to put pen to it and write it for me because that's not my cup of tea. (laughs) Um, and what we found adding on another 2,500, well, near 2,500 horses is that we started to see the two B group come into play a little bit. And by that, I say what I, and now it makes me wonder what if we expanded it to 6,000, would there be more clarity? So what we found in that study was grade ones and two A's, no significant difference in earnings, total earnings, earnings per start, et cetera. Um, Ones and two A's were identical in in, in, uh, performance. The two B group, we started to see 
uh, a difference in earnings and earnings per start at three, but it was just a wasn't quite significant. So not a strong correlation, but then at four, at age four, their racing age at four, the two Bs were um, lesser horses. At four, they had lesser earnings and earnings per start. Um, so they are, um, they do perform somewhat to a lesser degree. Now saying that there is a study that we're attempting to get published now. It was on two year olds and out of the two year old cell, about 650 two year olds. And we looked at ones and two A's and two B's and three, there's a few threes and it was remarkable actually. But what was interesting there was that the 2A group, and this is all you 2A doubters out there, the 2A group outperformed every other group, almost two to one. Even 2A group outperformed the grade one group, outperformed the 2B group, really two to one or in, or in, in earnings and in our average earnings, everything that we measured. Um, and the grade three group, they were terrible. Um, no paralyzed, no grade fours. And so what does that tell you? The two A's, the two A's were the superstars, bottom line. Um, another interesting thing that came out in that study, which we kind of thought but didn't know, was that there was significant difference in racing distance, which just makes sense if you think about the airway. They, the 2B group were a full furlong shorter in racing distance, winning, average distance, total, everything that we measured. They were a furlong shorter. So, and then there was one just for you uh, guys out there that like to get value, guys and gals that like to get value on horses. I had one 2B group that was a great, or one 2B horse that was a grade one winner, albeit a seven furlong race, a grade one winner. So you have, you have horses that, um, are outliers that outperform like they do the radiographs or whatever, you know, they have horses that, that outperform what they should, you know, we hear, <clears throat> we hear it all the time. Um, so that's what came out of that study, which, which was really, uh, remarkable that the two a group was, were the horses that had the highest earnings and, and earnings per star. So another, you know, the, we'll get back to epiglottises a little bit now. Um, have we, have we touched on a retinoid function in studies? I think we have question I get is, uh, do two more to, I've lectured in the last time I went uh, a couple times in Europe and they ask, well, the two B groups do that. Well, do, do, do they more of them get tiebacks? Well, not sure. We're trying to do a little study there. It looks like, um, my two Bs are maybe a little over overrepresented in our our population in in our surgery population. We'll see. Um, and and this is an important point that people these are my these are my airways. These studies that we're doing they're all my they're all my calls. And so, like I said, the the example I gave earlier about the 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 the, the horse at Tattersalls last year, my two B doesn't mean. It's your two B. Uh, my it might be your three. I may be uh, more critical, less critical. So it's just the way that it is. And it, it, that's a good point. I was trained by you, and and like you alluded to earlier, you and I don't call things exactly alike. We're pretty close, but right. but we're not we're not exact right. either. So the the so that's what um, really trying hard to get this. Uh, getting some pushback on some statistics, but, um, it's really trying hard to get this published in soon. Um, another study that we're working on that, uh, that, uh, we've all looked at horses that displace and they worry about that and pharyngitis, et cetera. And, um, and this, this the other study that we're putting together now, and we've run the stats on it. There was really no, we broke them down into, um, now these are displacing horses we're talking about. 
we broke them into three groups and there was about 760 horses in the group. And we broke them down as either no displacement or, you know, Bart, how one will displace one time and never displace the entire time again. And then we broke, that was another group and we just labeled them one. And then we labeled another group. Yes. Which that means they were displaced almost the entire examination. And it looks, what's funny is <clears throat> what's funny is the, the one horses outperformed the no horses. So the horses that displaced ones outperformed the horses that never displaced. And it was significant. So and what we ended up finding, then we, we looked at it. Uh, we looked at slightly and mildly flaccid epiglottises and then compared them. The bottom line is we didn't find any significance in displacing horses at a two year old sale. Uh, and, in this case, now I still would be careful because we know in the yearling study that if they have really short flaccid epiglottises, we know they're lesser horses. They don't do well. They don't do as well earnings, earnings per start, uh, and even starts for that matter. So we, we're still critical on short, really flaccid epiglottises. I'm talking moderate to severe almost looks like a piece of bacon laying on the, the uh, soft palate. Uh, but that, that kind of shows the limitations of the standing exam too, right? Because a horse displacing during a standing exam is different than a horse displacing at speed. Right. You, you know, you, you're scoping them at the, you know, on the racetrack for a reason. They're exercising tolerant or making noise or doing something. So you're going to see those horses in it. I still don't think uh, you can predict a uh, use a yearling or a two year old exam and predict the ones that are going to displace while they're in training. I don't think I don't I I can't do that. And everything that I've studied and and read and and we've published says you can't you really can't do that. Um, you know, you touched on the resting exam. I think a good point here is that people need to realize that's that's a small little segment in history there that you're looking at a resting horse. There was a study, oh, maybe nine years ago, was it Scotland or somewhere, that, that, that compared, did 50, maybe, I don't know if it was Ireland or Scotland, but anyway, it was, um, they, they looked at 57 yearlings, I think, and they did a dynamic versus resting. And it was amazing how many things they found that you could not see on a resting exam. So people need to realize that that's a, that's, the resting exam has limitations and the gold standard would be a dynamic endoscopy, but the, you know, it's a little impractical to do 4,000 yearling and uh, overground studies. But you know, you have um, pharyngeal collapse, which is almost impossible. I've had one in hmm, 38 years that I've suspected of any yearling that might have pharyngeal collapse and something wasn't quite right. And it turned out to be that. Uh, you have another condition. Uh, there's all kinds of epiglottic, the epiglottis can fold backwards. You know, we couldn't see that. You can have collapse of your arytenoids. You can have uh, a new thing out that's called VLAC. And it's, it's uh, I guess it just got a name because I didn't know what to call it. But uh, ventral luxation of the arytenoid cartilage. We're seeing more of that now that actually the tip of the arytenoid is prolapsed or herniates down into the airway. <clears throat> um, we're seeing more of that. I mean, possibly the, the conditions of sale at some of these public auctions needs, to, maybe we need to review that a little bit. The rostral displacement of the fer fer palatal pharyngeal arch, that's a little outdated. We know that's laryngeal fer um, dysplasia. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so... I don't know. It's a moving target. Yeah. I helped some friends move the other day. <laughs> I had their mattresses on the back of my trailer and it looked really good. And I was thinking about all this because when I hit speed, <laughs> those mattresses did some wild things that I didn't think they were going to do. And it's, it's a little bit the same thing with these horses. There's, there's so much air moving, moving through there that stuff does funny things. Right. Yeah. And you know, for, for listening to this from someone that doesn't do this kind of work, pretty obvious that there's a lot of opinion it's quite a subjective but you're trying to create uh, a standardization so people can talk the same language and when people get these reports they need to realize any degenerative change is going to be progressive and that exam is on that horse on that day it's like a radiograph and so when they're looking back in time 
and the horse may have been scored a certain way, it may score differently because that's just the process. So uh, we've uh, been here with Dr. Scott Pierce talking about the vagaries and the importance of upper airway endoscopy on horses at the time of sale. See you next time. Coming up on the second part of Dr. Scott Pierce's podcast. So you've talked a lot about the grading scales. Could you show us some examples um, of those particular grades? Sure. Let's see here, Bart. 